Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the fourth session and fourth and final session of today's events. My name is Kate Ogden, and I'm a research economist at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. This panel has been called "External Engagement in Think Tanks," and we're taking that quite broadly. Uh, so, as well as seeking to engage with government and to influence policymakers directly, a lot of the work think tanks do is trying to hear from the public or working directly with practitioners or with other parts of the public sector. Some think tanks also look to corporate or to individual memberships to raise funds and to hear people's views. And we also have a, a kind of slightly different kind of organisation, some membership organisations, which play a similar role to think tanks in influencing and in bringing about change, but have a membership network at the core. So we're gonna take that kind of broad view of what external engagement might mean. For today's panel, we have three speakers, Maddie, Denise, and Jess. I'm gonna ask each of our speakers to speak for around five minutes to introduce themselves and their organization and say a bit about the external engagement work that their organization does. We'll then have 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, if you've got any questions as we go along, type them in the chat and we'll come to them um, when we get to that Q&A. Uh, during the Q&A, if you'd rather raise your hand, we can uh, switch your, we can switch to you and hear your question from me directly. Uh, I think that's everything. So I'm now going to hand over to Maddie to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, my name is Maddie and I'm a Project and Inclusive Practice Officer at Involve. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Um, just a quick note to say that I've actually been a bit poorly recently, so please do excuse me if my voice goes a little um, throughout this, but hopefully I'll be okay. Um, so, Involve is the UK's leading public participation organisation. Um, and at Involve, we aim to bring in the voices of the public into decision making at local, regional and national levels. And we do this in many different ways, but some of our biggest work recently has been with citizens assemblies and citizens juries. So for instance, we recently ran Climate Assembly UK, which was the UK's first citizens assembly on climate change. And we also just delivered weekend eight of Scotland's Climate Assembly a few weeks ago. But we also work on local and regional levels. Uh, so for instance, I'm working on a project with the Environment Agency at the moment that's looking at a set of local citizens jury on water management. And I've also been working with Camden Council to help develop a data charter. So how does our work relate to think tanks? Um, Involve is not a think tank in the traditional sense. Um, instead, we seek to make change by promoting the role of public engagement in decision making. We believe that innovations in participation and deliberation, so for instance, citizens assemblies, give practical demonstrations of an alternative system to our current decision making processes. These practical demonstrations seek to shift how people and by people, I mean both the public and decision makers think about democracy. And these changing views and norms that people have then create the opportunity to reshape how our decision making institutions function. And then these reshaped institutions open up more space for further innovation in participation and deliberation. We see this as an ongoing and dynamic process of building support and momentum for our vision, which is a more open, inclusive and deliberative democracy where people have the genuine opportunity to have a say in important decisions that impact their lives and their communities. So if that's a little bit about Involve and what our work is, how and why did I get here? I've always been frustrated with the multiple and growing injustices and inequities in the world, and in particular, the feeling of helplessness that I'm sure we all have at times when we feel and when we witness and experience injustice and inequity. After completing my master's in international development at LSE, I joined Involve as part of the Charity Works grad scheme. I knew I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector, but I wasn't exactly sure where best to translate my academic skills and interests in the workplace in a way that felt truly meaningful. In particular, I knew I wanted to be involved in change, but I didn't really know how or what the practical steps were for this in a world outside of academia. Involve has been a great place for exploring change as it combines the academic thinking about democratic structures and institutions, about how change can happen and the processes that you go through to get there with the practical doing of project delivery. And this really allows you to see these ideas in action and see their impacts. It's a combination of the two that makes my work so enjoyable and has helped me to understand and also to challenge the ways in which the real world outside of academia works. So my advice uh, when thinking about getting a career in the think tank sector would be, um, is that as you can see from this panel, there's lots of different jobs and ways of influencing policy and change. 
Some people might want to campaign, some people might want to design policy, some might want to be politicians themselves, and some people might want to research. There are lots of different organizations here this evening, but a common factor is that we all deliver high quality projects that involve organization, thinking and analysis, and being able to write convincingly. So when considering working in the think tank sector, it's important to know what your interests and skills are and move towards that. So are you interested or good at project management, at advocacy, at research or strategy or design and facilitation? And from my experience, I would also really reiterate that there is space to bring your academic interests and ideas into the world of work to try and achieve change within your own organization, your community and your wider society. For instance, at Involve, I started a program, in work, a program of work that focused on how power and privilege intersect with public engagement and how we as an organization can and should address this. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about this later on. Thanks for being here this evening and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, buddy. That was great. Um, I'm now going to hear from Denise. Hello, so I'm Denise Hawkes and I'm the chair of the Education and Training Committee at the Royal Economic Society. Um, the Royal Economic Society is what you would call a learned society and it's focused around the promotion of economics, the study of economic science. And like all learned societies, it's kind of got two functions. One is to try to encourage people to consider and to learn something about economics and to see its true beauty, which obviously those of us who engage with the, um, the discipline really admire, but also to have a membership body, those made up of various economists in different types, um, who also seek to get something from the connection with other economists in the field. Um, in terms of people that work and work in the Royal Economic Society, there's a core of people that work in the central office for whom we wouldn't exist and wouldn't be able to function without. It sort of herd us all together as a learned society and make sure that we actually do things rather than sit and talk the great talks that we could have. Um, they, the range of posts in that space means that people can work in any role that you can imagine would exist in an organisation. And in the same time, you get to work with people like me who are academics in the field or professional economists in the field, actually doing things in terms of teaching the discipline or being policymakers using the discipline and actually trying to get herd us together to produce something positive. In terms of some of the deliverables, um, there's sort of two sides to that quite clear. The Discover Economics campaign is the bigger Royal Economic Society initiative, which now has other organisations on board around promoting diversity in economics. And it's really nice to be on a panel with women, I must say, but it, obviously in the usual day job in the, in the, as a professional economist or an academic economist, the vast majority of people that you will meet will be male. And that's not disrespectful to say that diversity in the discipline will bring us strength. And so investment in the, in the Discover Economics campaign is quite important, but that will only fly with the buy-in from the members. And organisations like the Royal Economic Society spend time trying to put together programmes where you can kind of bring the members in to take part in these events by encouraging um, action maybe financially or through networking opportunities. The other side of the institution, the organization is around trying to do something for the members. The survival of any learned society, unfortunately, will depend on members paying their fees. And that means having an offer that makes sense for the members. And as the chair of the Educational Training Committee, that's predominantly what we do, which is looking at the different groups of potential members, be they students at university, PhD students at university or academics, professional economists, and thinking about what we can do to facilitate communication between the groups and to provide some kind of encouragement for the discipline. And there's a range of different activities that we do from the annual conference to the journals to some more creative things around grant development, but essentially trying to leverage the skills of the members to serve the members whilst the backroom staff do all the work, which is really lovely. They keep us all together. So it's a really exciting thing to do. I think all learned societies will have a discipline at heart. And in, in order to work in those, it's sort of good to get a sense of the discipline. But it's not the case that you have to be an economist to work for the World Economic Society. And in fact, if we believe in the diversity that we're preaching, 
it's kind of nice to have people around who can keep our feet on the ground and make sure that we're solid. So I think that's about it, Kate. That's all I wanted to say. Um, but again, happy to take any questions around what membership organisations will be, um, particularly around these disciplines. Thank you. That's great, Denise. Um, particularly interesting. I'm an, a member of the RES, so it's nice to hear it from your side, um, what it is you're trying to do. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you do want to put any questions in the chat as we go along, feel free, and that gives them a better chance of, of getting around to them. Um, and finally, uh, Jess. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Jess Goble. I'm one of the senior program managers at the Living Wage Foundation. Um, so I guess we are the organisation at the heart of the Living Wage Movement in the UK and increasingly um, excitingly um, we are also kind of growing internationally as well and kind of sharing our expertise um, on I guess the the membership side of the living wage movement um, with with colleagues across the world um, in terms of I guess what we do obviously we set the living wage rates that's uh, I guess the thing we're sort of known for as the name might suggest the living wage foundation um, but as part of that kind of recognition and I guess where the membership part of this comes in um, is that we offer accreditation to employers who pay the, cal the, the rates that we calculate um, and that includes all of the directly employed staff and third party staff as well. Um, alongside that kind of main accreditation, we are also kind of increasingly diversifying our work into hours, pensions, um, and also working with service providers who kind of provide services to businesses that are accredited and working with them to, um, to basically increase living wage coverage around kind of third party contractors as well. And I guess that so that's where my team kind of fit into our model. So we work with employers um, in the program team to get them to get accredited. Um, it's I think this is the thing that's like the most interesting thing about my role and that I think that colleagues within my team find is like um, it's genuinely so fascinating to be able to go and speak to businesses like really quite high level like speaking to CEOs from FTSE 100 companies um, all the way through to like really dinky micro businesses that are just starting out but want to start with the foundations of, of fair work. Um, and it's like genuinely every day is different. It's really, it's always really fascinating to go into, to speak to businesses and like find out what they're doing, um, how they operate what kind of odd foibles they have um and it just makes it um makes the role really really interesting um and then i guess sort of moving across to to uh the work that we do in terms of our kind of research function now, this is i guess this is sort of where it's adjacent to think tanks in terms of the work that we do at the foundation um so obviously we coordinate the kind of announcement of the living wage rates every november um, but we also work with um, a couple of bodies to calculate that rate. So we um, work with Resolution Foundation to kind of calculate the rates. But we also have the Living Wage Commission who are kind of um, independently appointed and they basically make the kind of policy decisions that feed into the living wage rates. Um, aside from that, we also have our own research function, which is growing rapidly. <laughs> Um, so building our kind of intelligence around the, I guess, the, the landscape of low pay um, and how that can inform our policies in terms of how the accreditation should apply to businesses, but also how, um, like what more we can do in the kind of the realm of good work, essentially. Um, we also have... Um, and I guess that's sort of like the, the research team. And then we also have the kind of the, the I guess it would more fall into kind of the comms team, but also I think the program team do a lot of this work as well, um, which is the influencing piece. So obviously there's kind of like the, I think we've definitely heard from Denise and Maddie that there's, there's so many different kinds of roles that you can have within the think tank kind of sector and definitely within membership organizations. Um, and there's the kind of the comms function, whether that's sort of press, uh, social media, um, writing blogs for the website or kind of writing op-eds for kind of major newspapers from, from leading employers or from, from within our organization as well. Um, and then there's also the, the work that we do with um, different kinds of campaign groups. So we have things like Living Wage Places, which is um, where we work with employers to, um, <laughs> to, um, to basically get them to um, basically work with their people in their kind of region or city to get them to increase coverage of living wage there. So it's, um, there's a kind of influencing work that the, the program team can do, but then there's also the kind of influencing work that you can do with, um, with 
uh, with the com within the comms team as well. Um, and I think like Dan like Denise said that we also couldn't do any of this without um, the kind of the back office function, like our admins and um, kind of support staff and HR. Like there's all these kind of other roles that operate in the background, but we genuinely couldn't do without. Um, I think there was there was a point early today. I was in another meeting and it was like, oh, how do we do? breakout rooms there's no no one from our like from our admin team here like the, the person that was the host of things like oh I've never actually done one before so I don't know how we've managed to get to that point where um we've not managed to do that before but it was a yeah it was like a classic point where we're like wow we really can't do without our our admin team <laughs> um and I guess like it's it's an interesting one because I've been at the foundation now for five and a half years um when I started I came from retail so a completely different um, kind of scenario and set of work skills. Um, and also, I guess, even just the, the 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 environment that you operate in more than anything, like coming from shop floor into an office environment. I think it it was it was really different, definitely. <laughs> so if you're looking to sort of make the leap from a different a different career, like that is it's it there are kind of challenges around that, but there are so many transferable skills um that you can bring to the I guess the, the think tank party or the membership organization party that um really can make like a huge impact and just change up the way that an organization operates or thinks in um so there's there's definitely value in coming in from like a career change I think there's quite a lot of our team that have come in from like academic backgrounds um I think it's like there's someone that came from like film design so it is it's like it is really really different and I think that the the strength in that diversity of background means that we are like a stronger organization overall um for sure um but yeah I think it's it is really interesting like coming into um to like a different kind of organization and having these kind of different um different roles within that organization I think as well there's also something to definitely be aware of if you're looking at moving into this kind of I guess industry or sector is it's when I started, we had 10 staff <laughs> across the whole team, which was meant that you had to do everything. Like we shared oversight of the Twitter on like a rolling weekly basis. Um, like I used to look after our systems, for example, as well as doing kind of the program work. Um, and that has changed. Now we, we're around 40 odd staff. And I think that that definitely means that you can become kind of more specialized in the work that you do. Um, and can sort of develop in like a slightly more streamlined way but I think that's that's definitely something else to be aware of especially if you're moving into a small organization um if especially if you're moving kind of different from one career to another it is like suddenly it is like genuinely all hands on deck if you are moving into a smaller organization um whereas if you are like if you have a specific skill set it might be easier for you to move into a slightly larger organization where there are those kind of slightly more specialized roles but um yeah, I think I would definitely encourage anyone to kind of get involved in the in this kind of work because it is uh, like you learn so much. It's a really great opportunity to um, like certainly from my point of view to meet with businesses and just find out like what the heck they get up to on a day to day basis. Um, and it's like there's always kind of oddities and challenges that come up, but it just means that it is like a fantastic area of work to be working in for sure. Great. Thanks, Jess. Um, really interesting to hear from all of you. And also like particularly interesting because I, so I mentioned I work at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. I think we're more a tra sort of traditional research institute. So we think a lot about the sort of academic research side and less about the um, engaging with sort of a broad range of stakeholders. Um, I'm gonna wait for a few more questions to come in. So keep them coming, um, but I might abuse my chair privileges slightly. Um, a few of you touched on the kind of skills that you might be useful that you might need. I wondered whether any of you had reflections on how the set of skills are different when so much of your job is about engaging and communicating with sort of a group of members rather than policymakers and the public. Although I guess Maddie, you're very public focused as well. Any kind of thoughts on that? Okay, do I pick somebody, Maddie? Any thoughts? <laughs> Sure, sure. I'm, ha I'm happy to go. So, um, as I say, we actually do most of our work with the public. So I spend a lot of my time uh, talking and working with members of the public. Um, and as part of that, we um, basically become like a trained facilitator. So you get trained in how to facilitate conversations with members of the public. Um, but you also bring that into a lot of your stakeholder liaison because we work with the people that commission our projects. So that will often be with 
um, with national government or with local government. So we do also work with, um, with those people as well. Um, and really it's just those, those facilitation skills that you, you can get um, through those conversations that have been so uh, incredibly useful um, as part of my career so far. Have you got any thoughts, Denise or Jeff? I think the communication skills are definitely the one. So everybody, um, you know, who's directly employed by Res obviously has particular skill sets that they take on board. But what they need to be able to do is communicate that to those of us who may or may not, as members, understand the needs of the business. In fact, often in a learned organisation, we're so obsessed with our subject of knowledge in our case being economics, we may forget that there are practicalities in life. And I think it's the great, the good, they're really great, the team at Res, you know, just keeping us level and saying, yes, but there are practicalities here. And if you're going to do it, maybe we can leverage this opportunity, maybe we can do that. And it's about being really connected. So one of the reasons I'm here today is because um, our office manager, Mary Louisa, is really good at that connection stuff. That's her great skill set. And without her connections, we wouldn't be here speaking about our learned organisation. So I think we really look to the people that work in the office to, to keep us grounded and to make it livable what we say. I mean, we'd love everyone to study economics, but they're the team that make it happen. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I obviously came like retail, you almost like you spend your time selling stuff to people. And I feel like there was definitely a sort of a transferable skill in some form about like, um, I don't, and I don't think you necessarily have to like sell the living wage to people because I think if people have got in touch and want to find out about the living wage, they're probably like mostly sold on it. <laughs> and like understanding the benefits of paying it. But um, yeah, I think like that kind of communication skills and like being able to like understand and tailor your approach to the audience is just so important. But um, yeah, just having like enthusiasm backed up with knowledge is is like really key to um, to being able to kind of move the like for us, the living wage movement forward um, and sort of having that understanding of like how you can build power to make change, essentially, whether that's kind of within one small organization or whether that's kind of working with campaign partners to create that kind of wider campaign on a bigger employer, for example. Have a, a, we do have one comment that says it's great to hear you all talk so, uh, so passionately about what you do. It's so exciting. Just, just wanted to share. That's really lovely. Um, there's also a few questions around what advice you'd give people who are looking for internships, whether your organisations offer them, um, or whether you've got any uh, advice with hindsight about things you might have done to help get into your roles, get you the skills you needed. So any any tips on routes in? Uh, Jess, maybe while we've still got you. Yeah, I mean, I sort of came in the, the back, at, back route. <laughs> Um, so like one of the things that I did because um, I basically graduated in the previous financial crisis, good times, um, and uh, there was basically like no opportunities to be able to move into this this kind of space because it was just like unless you have the have done an, in, an unpaid internship at that time. Obviously, I feel like that is not the case anymore. Like if you had an in, um, unpaid internship, even like for a year, it would be like absolutely not. Um, but like being able to so I basically worked in retail but then like took some short term um kind of office based roles to try and build up some of those skills so like we use Salesforce as our system like I'd use Salesforce in one of those obviously it was in like a, a sales related um uh, role rather than like the, the database that we use to kind of manage our um our network but just having that kind of grounding in like trying to get some of those skills piece them together um whilst also actually being able to like live <laughs> and earn money um is like is a challenge but like there are ways to do it it's just being able to like just having the opportunity to be able to like take them up I think is is always a perennial challenge especially in today's climate um just in terms of like um internships as well like we don't have year-long ones like I feel like that's probably not necessarily a thing anymore but um we we have worked with kings uh, before who do like um uh, I think it was uh we did sort of I think it was six to eight weeks of um the students coming in like three days a week and then we had like an afternoon every two weeks of their time 
which was obviously paid at London living wage as well. Um, but that was, I think that was around six months over that kind of course of that time. So it's, I guess it's looking to see if there's anything that your university are doing. Um, but we also offer our, our own kind of short term in, internships um, where we kind of need to increase capacity. It's usually around kind of like comms rather than anything else. Um, but that is something that we, we do offer from time to time, again, paid at London Living Wage. <laughs> It'd be a shame if you didn't pay it really. I know, it'd be slightly <laughs> awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, Denise or Maddie, any thoughts on uh, routes in and with the benefit of hindsight, how could you get the skills that you needed? I mean, I'm quite fortunate in the sense that I come at this from the academic perspective and what it meant to actually be the chair of the Education and Training Committee really was just standing up and being willing to speak. And I think that often we don't do that we sit and we, we see our learning institutions, societies and we say, oh, if only they would do this and they would only do that, then economics would be so much better. Well, then it was needed for me to say, go on then, let's see if I can open my big mouth and make a difference. Um, but I think that the part that drives it is actually the strategic vision of the organisation. And I really, the, the bit that pulled me back into the RES was the strategic vision set by the CEO, I think, and, and, the, and the council and so on, that said they cared about diversity and economics. I'd sort of I'd previously been on the women's committee and done that work as a postdoc and thought, yeah, well, this is interesting, but it's not moving fast enough. No, I'm not going to bother with my membership. And it was renewing my membership was because of the direction set. And that comes back to the central team. And I can see Mary Louise are answering questions, which is great. But they, you know, it was really important that someone's got a handle on herding the members and, and it makes a difference. But for the membership side, I think we have to step up and we have to speak and we can't sit and wait for other people to fix things and be willing to volunteer. So in our case, we volunteer when we're on the member side. Um, and so that's, there's always an opportunity to volunteer. We have volunteers on the education and training committee. So if there are any master's students or PhD students on the call who would like to do that, we're always happy to hear from you and membership is not horrendous for the Royal Economic Society at that level. Thank you. That's, that's great. Kate, any happy if I jump in as well? Um, so I was just going to say, so I um, started out involved in 2019 and it was my first proper job out of university. Um, and I got there through the Charity Works grad scheme, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I would really recommend kind of anyone that isn't entirely sure where they want to go, but they know that they roughly want to go in the charity sector. Um, I would really recommend the programme. It's great. And you also, alongside getting placed with someone you get uh, with an organisation, you get kind of skills and development training um, as well alongside that. So that's kind of how I got into um, into uh, the sector. I know from Involve side, we don't offer any internships, but we have it's me and another member of the team that joined through Charity Works and someone else that joined through Change 100, which is uh, very similar to the Charity Works program. So I would really recommend looking out for those kinds of um, grad schemes as well. But in terms of um, kind of skills and the benefit of hindsight, um, I really do think it's important to stress that like, Go with what your interests are and what your skills are. Don't just feel that you need to fit into a box to get a job. Be yourself and go with where your interests are because then you'll fit into the job will work for you. Otherwise, you'll end up somewhere where you're unhappy and you don't want to be there anyway, regardless of how great this job sounds or this and that. Really think about what am I good at? OK, what am I interested in? OK, and there's an organisation that does that. So then talk to them, reach out to them and have conversations of communication. And that's where you're going to fit in and do well. So I would really recommend backing yourself and thinking about what you're good at and what your interests are and going with that. Excellent advice, Maddie. Um, thank you all. It's been great to hear from you. There are a few questions left. Um, mostly around whether they're how flexible work is and how much you get to speak to people in everyday jobs. Um, it sounds like you get to talk to loads of people um, and I get the impression actually works quite flexible. Maybe all nod if that sounds, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I think not a bad section to get in if you're into work-life balance and talking to people as well. Um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up there because we're at time. Um, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, panellists, for giving your views and thank you for all the questions. Uh, this is the last session of the day. Uh, we hope you've found the day useful. Uh, recordings of this session and all the earlier panels uh, will be available afterwards and the event organisers will be in touch. 
Um, but that's all from us. Thanks again and have a good evening. everyone.